Okay, so the relative rate, um, this is number 13 on daily segment one. It gives it, it it's a giveaway that this is Graham's law. Okay, and the formula for Graham's law is rate A divided by rate B is equal to the square root of molecular mass of B over molecular mass of A. When it says relative rate, it wants rate A divided by rate B. That's the relative rate. So they want one number for this whole thing. All right, so then I say, okay. Next thing I come to is this, which is A, and this, which is B. So whatever's first is A, whatever's second is B. And I just add up the molecular mass. So molecular mass of A is a sulfur, that's SO2, so I have 32.067 plus 2 oxygens. So I'll let you figure that out, whatever it is. And mass B is F2, if you need a calculator, there are over there by the flag, is 2 times 18.999. So you can get those. Then over here, you're going to say rate A divided by rate B is equal to square root, and you're going to put those numbers in. Remember that B goes on top and A goes on the bottom. And don't forget to do the square root for it. Usually on most calculators, you have to put the square root in first and then put your fraction underneath. Make sure you put parentheses around it. And then you'll get your answer. Okay? Any others that you go like to go over? I won't give you answers. I'll, I'll set up for you, but I won't give you answers. Yes, ma'am? 14? Okay, that's the next one. Um, number 14 has... I didn't answer the next question, or that little bottom question there for you, but I think you can do it. If it's less than one, then the one on top is faster. If it's greater than one, then the one on top is faster. Let me try that again. If it's, great, if it's less than one, the one on the bottom is faster. If it's greater than one, the one on top is faster. Okay, this is 14. Everything on this side is Graham's Law. Okay, so, and I can do that because it says speed. Anytime it says speed or relative rate, that's a clue. It's, it's Graham's Law. So I get to sulfur dioxide. That's my first one. That's A. Average speed. That's basically saying rate A is this. Okay, given in terms of average speed, nitrogen monoxide, that's my B. So I know it's going to be Graham's Law. And I know the formula is rate... A over rate B equals square root of mass B over mass A. Notice those did switch. Over here, I'm going to look up molecular mass of A, which is sulfur dioxide. Didn't I just do that up above? So we should be able to just grab that mass from up above. Rate A is equal to 45.0 meters per second. And mass B, this time, is nitrogen monoxide, which is just no, what little kids say a lot. So we get 14.067 plus 15.999, and get whatever mass B is. Then over here again, we are looking for rate B, so we're going to put in um, 45.0 meters per second over rate B equals square root of B over A. So the easiest thing to do probably is square both sides. No, not. Nope, it's not. Okay, put your numbers in, square root this side, and then um, you basically times both sides by rate B and divide it by this. So basically when you get done, your rate B is equal to 45, whoops, that's 45.0 meters per second, fancy little thing there, divided by the square root of whatever you had for B over whatever you had for A. And the units should be meters per second because you're looking at rate. So you just got to plug in numbers. Okay, any others?
Todd? <laughs> 15. Boy, we must have had a hard time with this back page. Either that or we just gave up. Okay, so an unknown gas. That is my gas A. Okay. Let me change color so I can see it. That's my A. This right here is equal to rate A divided by rate B. This is my B. So, as I'm writing, I can say rate A divided by rate B equals 10.55. My molecular mass A, I don't know. I'm trying to find that. My molecular mass B is phosphorus trichloride. So I'm going to add that up. Three chlorines and one phosphorus. My gas law again is grams. My formula, rate A divided by rate B equals square root of molecular mass B over molecular mass A. So over here I get 10.55 equals the square root of the PCL3 on top divided by molecular mass A. Now since this is underneath, this one you do need to square both sides to get rid of the square root. So you're going to square both sides. And when you do that, you get 10.55 squared and you get the mass of PCL3 divided by the molecular mass of A. Then you just basically switch these two places. So molecular mass A is going to equal whatever you added up for, whoops, PLC3 divided by 10.55 squared. So you just got to plug through. Okay, any other questions on any of this assignment? Okay, so if you for some reason did not finish, make sure you get corrected what you've got. Um, I'm going to pass some colored crayons, or colored crayons, colored pencils around. Um, I will still give you some credit for having it in late, as long as you don't have grace cards all used up, okay? Um, we're not turning it in, but by using the colored pencils, I know what you've done and what you haven't, okay? So if you'll pass it to a neighbor to be corrected by, that would be awesome. Switch them. I don't know how many I'm just throwing some at you. So if you if you didn't get that one done, still pass it and they'll correct the first day. And then just do that one and when you turn the packet in, I'll look at it. So I'm putting the, the pencils back here so you can turn them in later. All right, I'm going to turn off the video so that we can correct it for a minute, and then I'll turn it back on. Here. Okay, so when we look at our um, daily notes for this next part, um, let me just put this up so we can fill it in real quickly. You know what? I've actually got this. Let's see. Let me do this. Okay, so nuclear chemistry. A lot of people, when they think of nuclear chemistry, think of the bomb. Okay, so, but there's a lot of different things besides nuclear bombs that we use chemistry for, or nuclear chemistry for. We use it to create power in nuclear power plants. That's probably the second thing people think of. But they don't know that we use it in fire alarms. We use it in irradiating um, food so it can make it across the country without spoiling. We use it in medical to treat... Um, uh, cancers, we use it in medical to find broken bones, we use it in a lot of different things, okay? So it's not all bad. And it's thinking that it might want to change the page or not. So who discovered radioactivity? A lot of you probably have heard this person. 
um, and I'm not sure how, um, I think I followed this along with your notes. This is Mar Marie Curie, Madame Curie. Um, she discovered radiation. She found a rock that had special powers, and so she kept it in her pocket and carried it around with her, and that's what actually killed her because she had radiation coming into her body all the time. But she would put this rock on photo photographic paper, and it would leave marks, and she said it had a magical powers. Well, it did, sort of, but it also sort of killed her because she kept those magical powers around her too much. And as we know, you know, radiation technologists have little badges to make sure they don't get too much exposure being around radiation all the time. We have um, types of radiation here. The first one is known as alpha. It doesn't have that little squiggly at the top, but I couldn't find it by itself. It's just basically that. Okay, so that is alpha, and it is a 4,2 helium. And it's said to have a positive charge. So go ahead and fill that in across. Um, beta is the fancy looking B here, our Greek B, and it's basically called an electron. It's not really electron, but we call it an electron, yes. Is that the symbol? This is the symbol, this is the actual representation. Okay. And then gamma is pure energy. It's called a gamma ray because it is pure energy. It doesn't have any mass to it. And so we get zero, zero gamma. The, the, the symbol is just gamma. Okay. I guess I should put beta over here. All right. Don't want to rush you. I want to make sure you get down. Yes, Todd. We'll get there. We'll get there. Yep. Nope, we'll get there. I just couldn't get it all on one page. So we're going to go through the symbols, and then we'll talk about the penetrating ability. We good? Okay, moving on. A neutron is 1, 0, N. That makes sense. A positron. How many are just Trekkies in here? No Trekkies? Oh, so sad. Data that was in, in Star Trek um, was said to run on a positronic brain rather than electrons. So it's a positron instead of an electron. Okay, so we have a positive thing. Proton is basically a hydrogen one, so one one hydrogen. Um, and they don't have another, sometimes you'll see a neutron just symbolized by N, sometimes you'll see a positron just by a P. And, and a, a proton sometimes is written like this, okay? Um, any other I elements, we'll talk about their isotopes. So we're going to be using isotopes again. So how do they penetrate? Well, I can stop an alpha radiation by holding up a piece of paper. It can't make it through it. Beta, though, can make it through the paper, but 0.5 centimeters of lead stops it. Oh, that's why they put that funny apron on you at the dentist's office. That's lead, 0.5 centimeters of lead. Well, 10 centimeters of lead will stop um, gamma. Okay, think of 20 of those aprons on you. You'll be able to breathe. Or it can stop with 5 feet of concrete if you'd rather. So it takes a lot. So when we build nuclear power plants, they usually do a combination of the concrete and the lead around the outside in the dome so that the radiation can't get out if there's an, an, an accident. But you probably need to know both the 10 centimeters of lead here and the 5 feet of concrete. Okay? Now, as far as the others, we don't really worry about their penetrating ability, so you can put an X through their boxes. Okay? Now, to balance a nuclear reaction is a little bit different than re balancing a chemical reaction. To balance a nuclear reaction, you look at the mass numbers always written on top and the atomic numbers written on the bottom. What was the mass number? Does a review. What's the mass number? Protons plus neutrons. Okay, what's the atomic number? What's the atomic number up here represent? So mass numbers, protons plus neutrons, what was the atomic number? Just protons. So, and in a neutral atom, it's also the number of electrons, right? 
but if it has a charge, then the electrons are the things that, that change, not the protons, because the proton identifies the element. So if I have 46 protons, it's pallid palladinium. I probably should have picked a different one that I have an easier time saying. Um, 50 um, protons would be 10. Okay, so here's how we write them. So if I have a nuclear reaction, an alpha emission, this is what happens. I start with radium. 226. It can be written this way or it can be written this way. Either way is acceptable. Or I can actually write it like this. Okay? Those are all acceptable ways to write it. On the bottom two, I haven't told you what the atomic number is. I have to look on the chart and find it and get the atomic number. The numbers on the top going across, this is like an equal sign have to add to equal on both sides. Okay, so the numbers on the bottom also going across have to add to equal each other. You see that? Okay, all right, so next um, mass number goes down by four and atomic number goes up by two. Nucleons, okay, whatever. So next thing here, we're going to look at a beta emission. So last was an alpha emission. This is a beta emission. What do you notice when it says emission? Where's the alpha and beta put? Where do I put it in the reaction? On the reactant side or the product side? Product. So if it's an emission, it's going to go on the product side. So again, you know, here was the top, and below the blue line is the bottom, and they have to equal each other. They'll often give it to you like this and ask you to write it, leaving off one of them. So you should be able to do that. Okay. So other types of nuclear reactions. We have a positron that we can give off or emit. So if I'm em emitting a positron, I still have to make the sides equal. The top and the bottom have to be equal. Okay. Now, the electron capture. It's just like what it says. It's capturing an electron. Capture means on the reactant side. So if I'm bombarding or capturing, it's going to be on the reactant side. If I'm emitting or decaying, it's going to be on the product side. All right? So let's try one. So here's one that should be on your notes, I believe. Yes? Okay, so over here we have 10 plus 4 is what? 14. What plus 1 is 14? 13. So I'm going to just write it down here because it's going to come in. Maybe I'll write it down there. So we have 13 on the top. On the bottom we have 5 plus 2 is 7. 0 plus 7. So what is 7? This bottom number tells me the name, the identity of the element. What is 7? Nitrogen. Let's see how we did. Boom. Got it. Okay. Let's try another one. So write the nuclear equation for the beta emitter. So that's going to be a beta on the what side? Product side, right? And having co um, cobalt 60. So do you have that one? No. Messed up again. Okay. So we start with cobalt 60. We end up with a, uh, I didn't fix this one to the new format, sorry. We end up with a beta right here. That's a beta. And I end up having one more on the bottom because these two have to add to get to this one. Okay, bottom number tells me the identity. So we have a lot of new elements because we bombarded them with neutrons or we pushed them together in the Hadron Collider. We've done a lot of things with them. Reactions using neutrons are usually called gamma reactions because gamma rays are given off. Okay, so if I have a gamma reaction, it's because a gamma ray is given off. Radioisotopes used in, me in medicine are often made by gamma reactions. So we're often bombarding them with neutrons to make the isotope unstable so it will decay quickly when they put um, radioactivity into you, either look at your thyroid or look at your intestines or look at any part of your body. They target that part of the body that uptakes that, that element. 
and then they're able to look at how it's dispersed inside of that element over time, or at that body part. So here we have one, an example. P31 is used in studies of how our body takes up phosph phosphorus. So they take phosphorus, they bombard it with a neutron, and we get phosphorus 32 and gamma rays. Then they give you phosphorus 32, and since it's not stable, it will quickly decay. Transuranium elements. That's beyond 92 on the periodic table, so find 92. It's down the bottom in the F. It's uranium. Uh, we're made starting with a gamma reaction. So here we have a gamma reaction. Uranium is often used in, um, uranium-239 is often used in nuclear power plants. So uranium-239 and it's given off a gamma ray. That becomes a daughter and that daughter then decays. So we have a, a parent, we have a daughter, we get a new daughter, and that daughter decays. So we have this daughter, and this makes a new daughter. So anything that is made in a decay, this is called a decay series. We start with a parent, and every time we decay, we get a daughter. Okay. This reaction right here, um, since it's got a beta decay each time, sometimes they just put the beta above the arrow and don't put it in the product so that you know that it was done by beta decay. So a lot of times they'll do that. Or they'll just say that uranium-239 underwent a beta-beta decay. What is the final product? Okay. So this is fission. This is what we use in nuclear power plants. I have uranium-235 here. It's hit by a neutron. It becomes uranium-236 unstable. Uranium-236, because it's unstable, decides to split I get three more neutrons, and I get a uh, krypton and a barium given off, which are more stable than the uranium-236. Okay, so that's fission. Fission is splitting apart. Um, we usually have some, some things in a fission chain. We have to initiate it somehow, and usually it's with a neutron. So we initiate it with a neutron. We propagate it because when it broke apart, it gave me three more neutrons. So those three more neutrons will go hit three more uranium-235s, making uranium-236s. They will break down, give me three more. So it's like a big family tree or a big root system. And the problem is, like with Chernobyl, um, Chernobyl's 30th anniversary is this year, right, right about now. Um, they couldn't stop the chain reaction. They had to get a neutron absorber onto the Chernobyl plant because the sarcophagus, um, the shell, had broken down. And so they had to go in and they did, basically did a suicide mission. Um, the pilot and the group that went over it knew that they wouldn't live through it. They went over, they dumped a bunch of pro, um, neutron absorber onto the plant. By the time they got back, they had radi radiation poison so bad they died within a couple weeks. Um, and it's, a, it's an ugly death with radiation poisoning. Um, there's still plants that are high in radioactivity at the Chernobyl site, even 30 years later. And there's still a higher incidence of lots of cancers in the surrounding areas that are still um, allowed to be populated. And there's been several articles in the paper about that lately. So keep an eye out. You get a chain reaction. The problem with this is you've got to be able to control it. So in nuclear power plants, they have fuel rods and they have control rods. The control rods are put in to control the neutrons. They absorb the neutrons. What happened in Chernobyl was a big series of mistakes. They decided to um, test the plant. So they shut off the cooling system, shut off the water. They pulled the control rods. When they did that, the reaction got so hot so fast that the mechanical processes of putting the, con the control rods back in melted. They were gone. And by the time they tried to put them back down, they couldn't. And even when they finally melted and fell in, the control stuff that was putting them in and out, the reaction was so far gone, there was not enough neutron absorber to stop the reaction. 
So um, it was, it was they, they didn't think it through before they, they tried that. So what we get is we get a, a band of neutron stability or a band of isotope stability. That's the black ones in there. Red around them are unstable. So this band of neutron stability, um, basically for 1 through 20 is a 1 to 1 ratio. So you get one proton for one neutron and you're stable. Anything other than that, then you're unstable. Past 20, it starts to go to 1 to 1.25 neutrons. And as you get even farther along, it goes to 1 to 1.5. It's stable because the bigger molecules need a little bit more neutrons to handle to keep steady. So as we go on here, i um, not going to worry about that with you guys. Okay, so that's a bigger picture of the neutron stability. You can see the black with the N. Those are my stable ones. So, fission process looks like this. Now, when we were looking at the other one, instead of giving off two neutrons, this is just if it gave two neutrons off. It gave off three. So you can see how quickly that expanded a lot more. Okay? So how do we use it in power? Well, currently there are about 103 nuclear power plants in the U.S. and about 435 worldwide. That's about 17% of the world's power. France uses the most, Lithuania, Belgium, and you can see go down to 19 for the, for the United States. And I said, well, but nuclear power plants are so dangerous. Not if they're run correctly. And there's been a lot more improvement in nuclear power plants than when they first started. They don't need as much nuclear react reactivity. And they've actually, instead of done... Instead of doing fuel rods, they've done fuel pellets, which they're able to control a little bit more. And they put them in a, like a hopper now. Okay, this is an old version of a power plant, but it's still basically the same, same th three things. There's three stages. The first stage is this yellow one. This is known as the fuel system. Okay, it is a closed system. It is not open at any time to the steam system, which is a purple one. So if some leaks, something happens and my fuel rods leak and it gets into this, cool, this system that's going around, it's going to stay in those pipes until those pipes corrode. If at any point those pipes corrode, they're all within the sarcophagus, except for this little area right here, right? In that little area right there, if the pipes corrode, then it can get into the purple system, right? So if there's a problem and they detect any whatsoever in this purple system, the whole thing shuts down. That's what happened at Three Mile Island. Okay? They detected a small amount getting into the water system. Shut everything down. Control rods totally in, fuel rods totally out. They shut everything down. Um, and they went, oh, but there was so much radiation coming out of here. There was, <laughs> it was less than an x-ray. It was less than an x-ray. But it was a big deal. And so now everybody thinks it's so horrible. Nuclear power plants have a lot more safety precautions than, say, a coal-fired um, power plant or a hydroelectric power plant. There's a lot or a power plant. There's a lot more things going on. The other problem that the older plants had, this is a cooling system. And probably a lot of you have seen nuclear power plants represented by this with steam coming off like this. That's a cooling tower. They run the hot water through it, the steam from the atmosphere condenses on it, and it cools the water back down. So it can go back into the system, return to steam, and come back down. That's all it is. It's a cooling system. But that's the symbol of nuclear power. Okay? So how does that work? It basically works the same thing, way as coal power or water power. They're trying to generate some steam to turn a turbine. Now, water power just uses the water to turn the turbine. Coal powered, they heat the water up, generate steam, turn the turbine. Nuclear, they heat the water up, generate steam, turn the turbine. Okay, that produces electricity. Then they have to cool the steam down. So coal power plants have to do the same thing as nuclear power plants as far as cooling it down. The problem came is when they picked nice trout streams to pull water from, and they put water back in at bass stream temperature, and it would kill all the trout. So they had to find a way to make sure that this temperature right here didn't get higher than this one. OK? 
okay? So the last one was just pumping water and, and being able to use it to cool down. So that's why they went to that to cool it down. So they had water and they just kept reusing the same water rather than pumping and pumping out. Okay? All right, so nuclear fusion. How many remember when the U of U had this big thing a couple years ago, cold fusion, it's all the rage. And then they came back and said, you've done your work wrong. There's no way we can have cold fusion. Fusion is what happens on the sun. Fusion gives off tons of energy. It's really hard to control really hard to control. So think of cold fusion, I can control that energy and get all that energy off and not blow my world up. That would be good. Blowing my world up is bad, right? So I'll take two smaller elements and I smash them together and I get a bigger element. Well, we're sort of doing that right now with the Hadron Collider and I'll show you some pictures of it later. But they have to get down to almost zero Kelvin. And it's very, very large and they have to accelerate them up and then they smash two elements together, okay? All right, fusion. With fusion, we have excess heat that cannot be contained. It's attempts at cold fusion have failed. Everybody's tried but can't get it. And hot fusion is really difficult to contain. Basically, think of harnessing the sun at the sun's level, like going up to the sun and being able to walk on the sun kind of thing. So it'll be really hard. So half-life, oh, did I go too fast? I'm sorry. Uh-huh, just keep me on track here. Half-life is where we're going to start next time, so I'm going to stop right now, okay? Stop.